and we're live. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining our fifth online Los Angeles user group. Uh, it took us a while to kind of put it together with scheduling conflicts and, and projects launching in the symposium and all these events going on. And uh, so finally, we're back online. Um, and uh, we're happy to continue and keep going. So today we have a really, um, a couple of really interesting presentations. Um, actually, I have a list of questions already prepared for the guys. I haven't told them yet. <laughs> uh, so one uh, is uh, by Mike Reynolds. So guys, if you know anything about Psycho, you know Mike. Um, so he'll uh, he'll talk to us about Psycho dependency injection, and then Chirag will. Um, uh, Pick that up with Sitecore 9 upgrade. So there's you know a lot going on uh, about Sitecore 9, and I'm actually personally very interested in, in seeing what he has in stock for us. So uh, without further ado, let's uh, get started. Mike, why don't you take it away? All right. Um, before I start, how do people ask questions? I sh I need to ask that question first. Uh, so there's chat. Uh, here, so if people join, um, they can ask questions. It's also on YouTube. Uh, if you click on that link, here, let me uh, paste the link to YouTube here and hang out chat. Yep. That. So if you click on that uh, on YouTube over on the right side, you'll you'll see the chat window as well. Mike, I've got the chat window open, so if anyone has questions, I can uh, follow up with you on that. I awesome. Can... All right. Oh, and. And uh, sorry, Mike, to uh, sorry. interrupt. Uh, for, for people who are, for some reason, uh, uh, not on YouTube, um, uh, watching this on your phone, feel free to tweet us questions. So use chat on YouTube, tweet us questions, uh, hashtag LASUG. Cool. Anyway, Mike. Sweet. Uh, share my screen. All right. Um, so I'm going to talk about DI on Cycler 8.2 and up. Um, as Vasily said, you know, any questions, tweet with the LA SUG hashtag or also Cycler UG. Um, gonna jump right into this. Um, who am I? Um, I am Mike Reynolds, AKA Cycler Junkie, AKA Cycle Wizard, AKA whatever thing you wanna call me. Um, I, you can call me the Italian Stallion, the Master of Disaster, maybe even Apollo Creed, and I just made all those things up. I'm just Mike Reynolds, I'm just some guy from New England, here to share some cool stuff with you, and the credit for this photo goes to Mark Stiles. All right, so what is dependency injection? Well, it is a software design pattern. Basically, it implements the IOC uh, pattern for resolving dependencies. Um, typically, I would ask the audience, can somebody tell me what that all means? And make it interactive, but I can't see you guys, and you guys can see me, I'll just talk through it. So basically, you know, in a nutshell, you can consider it like the Hollywood principle, which I believe uh, Robert C. Martin came up with. Um, it's uh, don't call us, we'll call you type of thing. Um, it's all about the S, or I would say pretty much all the letters in solid, you know, people talk about solid uh, when it comes to software development. Um, it's all about single responsibility principle, Make sure your stuff is object oriented. Uh, do follow the Liskov substitution principle, uh, interface segregation principle, and also uh, I think it's called like dependency inversion or something like that. But really, it's all about have a class, be good in, at one thing and one thing only. Don't have duplicate code all over the place. Definitely make sure things are backed by interfaces, and you know delegate to those other classes when you need to use them in your classes. Um, why is this a good thing? Well, it's all about promoting uh, loosely coupled code, which means that, hey, have things back by your interface. The implement details details behind the scenes really don't matter. What matters is that things are adhering to the interface so that when you make a change in that implementation, it won't break everything else. Uh, high cohesion, it's all about likes go with likes. So, you know, over time, as you're kind of doing this, you'll notice things will start falling into place where things that kind of work together will be alongside each other in code in pretty much the same solution. And this kind of sets you up with Helix. So we all keep hearing about Helix principles and things like that. 
Helix is basically a way to achieve all this. And DI is really what you need to kind of master in order to get on board with the Helix principles. So I'll talk about DI on Sitecore 8.2 in particular. This actually applies to all versions on 8.2 and up, including 9. Um, it uses Microsoft's uh, DI framework out of the box, which is the stuff that comes with .NET Core. It's actually in there in the framework on version 4.52 or whatever. Uh, you can uh, you get out of the box whatever Microsoft built uh, to work with that, but you can swap it out with another framework if you want. Um, I think it was the buzzword about a year or two ago was conforming containers versus non-conforming containers. Basically, all that means is that Microsoft created an interface for uh, something that will build up something to manage your dependencies, and it's in, it's called iService Provider. A conforming container would implement that interface, and it will resolve dependencies for you if you do service locator. If you can swap out that, you know, you can kind of, let's say, build a framework around that to use non-conforming containers, such as dry IOC, or even something like, um, I'm trying to remember of another one, but you can, if you get it to return an iService provider, you'll be all set and you can swap it out with something else. I'll show an example of that. Um, it's something that I didn't build, but I'll give credit to the author when we get to that point. Um, you can register your dependencies through a few different ways. Um, you can do it through a configurator, which is basically just a C sharp class that implements a certain interface that comes with Psycho.kernel now. Um, you can manage uh, your dependencies, you know, that way through code. Um, you can also do it through Psycho configuration, which a lot of us are kind of more used to. Um, I, you know, have strong opinions on this where I don't think you should do it through configuration, but you could if you had to. And then I'm going to show some magical uh, automatic controller registration code that Sitecore MVP can figure out. Um, you can also do service locator, as I mentioned. Um, please don't do this or only use it when you have to, but really a lot of things in Sitecore will are set up in such a way where you can inject dependencies into your classes. Um, their only exceptions are uh, commands. So a lot of us are used to commands for wiring up the things like custom ribbon buttons and uh, even commands for the experience editor and things like that. Um, it won't work with that because that's been instantiated through an older system that existed before the configuration factory and the DI stuff. You also can inject into uh, data views, which kind of govern how the uh, content treats rendered inside of the content editor. You can inject into those, but uh, those would be kind of cases where you would have to use service locator. Um, I'll zoom in real quickly so that you can kind of see what that looks like. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but this lives in Sitecore.kernel. So it's under Sitecore.dependencyinjection.serviceLocator, blah, 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 blah. Please don't use that. Please avoid it as much as you can unless you really have to. Um, let's have a look at what this looks like. So. I'm going to, before I jump into some code examples, i like point out something in uh, Cycle configuration that now exists. It's something here called Service Provided Builder. So this is the out of the box class that will build up your container uh, based in, it's all based off of the configurators that you will wire things up into them. Uh, there's some magical code here that will grab all those uh, dependencies and put them in a container and then return the I service provider. Uh, one thing to note is that like in other things in Cycle where you can use the configuration factory to inject sub elements into a class, you can't do that with this because the configuration the configuration factory class, basically that's the factory dot whatever dot whatever is now in the container. So it wouldn't make sense to try to delegate to it when it doesn't even live at this level yet. Um, you can swap it out. If you had to swap it out, you just replace this guy using a patch configuration file or a set configuration file, and then you can have your own container be built up and return it. Um, also, we have a new show services config page, which lives under the admin folder. Um, by the way, if you navigate to just like for admin, you'll see a list of all these pages that will that you can like leverage, such as 
show config, show service config, and other things. But here, just keep note of this. You can navigate to this directly, and you'll see everything that lives in the container. Uh, what does this all mean? Service type. This is basically, okay, what is the interface? And I'm putting that in quotes because it could also be a base class, a base abstract class. So it's basically just a, some kind of definition and then, or contract per se. And then over here, service implementation is the actual, let's say, concrete class that gets served up. So for, let's say, we look at this base item manager guy, there's actually an implementation of that under default item manager in it manager uh, you could swap it out if you wanted to um, you can also use factory methods so that's basically just uh, it could be like a lambda or a delegate where that will build something so you pass let's say something to it like I think it passes the iService provider interface to that delegate or let's say uh, funk per se and then you just do whatever you have to do within that block of code and return back your object and that will get served up over here when a class requests that particular service type um, over in the very far right column we have the lifetime column so in di you can uh well some di systems there are multiple lifetimes but in this particular framework there are only three this singleton this transient and then they're scoped. So singleton, it's a, you know that design pattern that means an object will only exist once in code. Uh, this is a way to have that only exist once in code and have it be used all over the place. And you can have it be backed by that service type, which is an interface of some sort. Um, you can have transient. Here's an example of it right here. This means that it, a new object is going to get created every time you want it. Then scope means that it will only one instance will live during a particular scope of code. So it could be a thread or it could be a web request or whatever it is, but it'll only live during that one scoped block of code that's running. Um, as you can see, a lot of these things have cycro.kernel in them. So that means, you know, the cycro product team did a lot of work in refactoring some of the existing cycro bits to work in this framework. And uh, kudos to that team because they spent you know, a lot of time doing that. And I'm glad they did because now it makes things a lot easier to swap things out and change things. And you can add your own stuff in here. So we'll be seeing some examples of some custom stuff. Here's an example of something that lives in there that I built um, that I'm gonna show during this presentation. And you know, if you ever wondered why, hey, I'm getting this crazy exception where it says it can't instantiate something because it can't find it, it's probably because it's not in the container and you didn't wire it up properly. But uh, let's jump into a facetious example that you may encounter, which I doubt it's facetious, right? Um, all right. I, let's say you have this crazy requirement where you have a number field like this, and I'll prove it's a number field. It's basically just some number, and it's a number field. Let's say you had to round up <clears throat> or round down to the two nearest decimal places in here for whatever reason. You know, uh, I'm not saying you should do this because really, you know, there are better ways of handling things like this. But let's just say you have that kind of requirement. And let's say you put in, I don't know. So this should round to round down. Us. But then let's say we get to a place where we have something like this. It rounds up. All right, so how did I do that? Well, first thing I did was I created an interface for some kind of service class. And when I say service class, I don't mean like a RESTful service. I mean some kind of class that will perform some kind of service. Um, it's going to take in a double, and it's going to round it and return a double, rounded. So the implementation of that, there's really nothing crazy here. I'm just using the math utility class around the number to the two nearest decimal places. Um, I recommend not hard coding your stuff like this, like I did. I just put it in here for this presentation, and it's all for pedagogical purposes only. You definitely wouldn't hard code your stuff, just throwing that out there. So, okay, we have a class that does, 
never running to the two nearest decimal places. So how did I wire it up into Cycler? Well, I needed a way to trigger that on save on an item inside of the content editor. So how did I do that? Well, I created a save, I created a, a custom save UI pipeline processor. That's the pipeline that runs when you save something within the content editor over here. Um, this isn't the same as like a saving event. This only runs when you're when a human does this within here. Um, if you do this programmatically in code, it won't ever get triggered. That's when you have to do an item saved event or saving or something like that. Um, so I created a save UI pipeline. I gave my pipeline processor an interface. Why did I do that? Well, I need to do that because I'm going to put my pipeline processor in the container. So like all good save UI pipeline processors, they take in a save args, ar save args, let's say model, for lack of better terms. It's a DTO object that Sitecore will pass to it and process and do magical things. In the implementation part, I'm just going to move this over a little bit. It has a process method like all pipeline processors pretty much have, unless you define a certain method on your uh, pipeline processor in configuration. But if you go, if you notice this, before we jump into this, look at this constructor. I'm passing things to it. So where's this stuff coming from and what exactly is this stuff? Well, this is where the DI power comes into play. It's going to pass stuff to it as long as it's in the container. It will pass these things that live in the container as long as they're actually there. <clears throat> so standard values manager is now has a base class which is, serves as the interface. This is this particular thing lives there to check whether an item's standard values or not. Uh, here's that service type that we I talked about that rounds numbers, passing that in. And here's my base log implementation, which is actually the logger in Cycler right now. Everything lives in here. I'm injecting this directly in here, and I'm putting them on private properties. Um, you'd probably want to put them on private variables just for optimization purposes, but when I built this, I wasn't thinking about that. I just threw it in here for that purpose. But, you know, when it gets compiled down, these getters and setters become methods. So it's better to put it on private members, but I won't go into that. So down here, I'm iterating over all items within the args object. So Sitecore pretty much like was thinking uh, in the future about, hey, you might be able to select multiple items in the content tree. But as we know, you only can select one at a time. So this collection will only contain one item at any given point that's selected over here. So, but just for good measure, I decided to iterate over the collection, just in case. Um, what do I do? So this save item uh, object is the representation of the item before it gets saved. So when you make changes, it will get put into the, one of these into these guys before it actually saves to the database. Um, here I'm grabbing the actual item from the, the content database, and I do that here. Why am I doing that? Because I want to do some checks. So I want to see if this thing is standard values. Because if it's sitting in your values item, I don't want to do anything. You know, let's say somebody's making a change there. I don't want it to round up or round down. Or maybe you do. But in this case, I didn't want to do that. Um, then I'm going to iterate over all the fields on that particular item. And this is a save field uh, object. Because that's going to contain the latest values that have been saved in, or are going to be saved in the database. Um, I check to see if it's a number field, and I do that like this. I'm sure, there's a better way to do this, but this is how I did it here. Like I said, don't ever hard code your stuff. I only did that here in this presentation, but definitely don't hard code something like this. But we're just checking if it's a number field, and if the value can be parsed out as a double, then we just round it to the two nearest decimal places, like through our service class. And then we save it as a string, and this will format it properly so it'll get saved in here. Um, as all you good, diligent Cycler developers know, everything in Cycler is a string. So that's why I cast it back to a string, and I put it in the in the value property of the save field, field instance. 
and then just we'll keep going and just exit out when everything's done. And then everything will just get magically saved behind the scenes. So that's one example of using DI. Oh, and I didn't finish. Uh, I had to register uh, my dependencies in the container, and I decided to use the configuration just to show you that, hey, this is how you can do it through configuration if you had to. Um, I don't think you should, but you could if you had to. So what did I do here? I needed to register my number rounder, and I did that through the services element that lives in Cycler configuration under the Cycler node. Here's the service type, and this is actually the interface. And here's the concrete class I want to be served for that. And the lifetime is singleton, because I can reuse this all over the place. And it will be only one instance of this object in memory at any given point during the application lifecycle. Uh, likewise, I did the same thing for the actual pipeline processor because I want that. To, that has to live in the container in order for me to inject things into it. And just like all pipeline processes that you add, you have to add it your custom processor within the pipeline section of the configuration. So I'm going to patch this before the actual uh, processor that does the magical saving. And I want to use this service type. And that will magically go to the container, find it, and do its magic. One thing to notice is I ha you have to put this on like this. So you have to do resolve equals true in order for Cycler to know to go find it in the container. If you don't have this on, you'll probably get some crazy yellow screen at that saying, hey, I don't know how to handle this stuff. And it will just bomb out because it won't know how to instantiate this because it will expect a parameter list uh, constructor. So that's one example. What? So let's look at a, an example that's actually more useful. Everybody loves Cycler tokens, right? Um, everybody loves Cycler tokens, especially when you add a new field to, let's say, an existing template, and then on standard values you add that token, and it spills through to all the items that already exist that implement that template, right? Well, what if? Whoops. What if you had something that can actually do um, this, that can expand these like on save? Oh, looks like I don't have that one in there. I think it's template ID. Maybe it's just, maybe it's just, maybe I didn't put that in there. This is ID real quick. All right. So how did I do that? I mean, so, of course, I created a service class that does things with tokens. So let's have a look at that real quick. I put that under here. So just like the other one, I created an interface. And on this interface, this is an object or objects or any type of object that's going to see if an item has tokens on it. And it's going to expand tokens on an item. For the actual implementation, I'm just going to move this over so we can have a look at this. Matter of fact, I'll just collapse this. In this class, I'm injecting the logger class, and I'm going to put it on a private uh, private property. Like I said before, this probably should be a private variable just for optimization purposes, but in this case, I didn't do that. I'm also getting the master variables replacer class. So this lives in configuration, and this is a Cycler configuration factory class to grab stuff. Why am I doing it like that? Well, there is no base class for this. Uh, this is one of the things that wasn't refactored in the product to use uh, to be put into the container, so I had to grab it this way. Anyways, I created it virtual so that you can swap it out with something else as long as it implements this base class. I set that also on a private property. And I'm doing that so I can use it in other methods here. So I have a method that checks to see if there are any tokens on an item. And I'm sure there's a better way of doing this, but I did it like this. So I call read all on fields so that I can get all the fields, including those that are defined in standard values. So if you, let's say, 
value for your, your item and it's coming from standard values, when you call fields and get the fields collection, that field won't show up unless you do read all and you can get them all. Um, I'm going to iterate over all the fields and then I'm going to iterate over another collection of tokens that I hard coded in here. Like I said, don't ever hard code your stuff, but I did, did that here just to show you guys how to implement something, but definitely there's some room for improvement for uh, cleanup here where you probably have this managed somewhere else, maybe configuration or somewhere else. I also had to hard code them or put them in here because you can't access this collection of tokens from the master variables replacers class. <clears throat> it's kind of hidden. That's why it's in here. And I needed to do that so that I can actually go check and find tokens. If a field or any field that I iterate over, if its value contains a token, then I return true because that means it has at least one token. Otherwise, I'll return false because it didn't find any. The other method, I'm just going to pass the item along to the master variable replacer class to replace all the tokens on that item. I first have to put the item in editing mode. And then when everything's all hunky-dory, we take it out. Any If there's an exception, I cancel that edit, and then I log it. In, by the logger class that I passed in through the constructor because DI gave it to me. Uh, also, just like I did in the previous example, I created a custom save UI pipeline processor for that. So just as the other one, I created an interface for it because I have to put it in the container somehow. Um, as the other one, it has the same kind of signature as a process method that will take in the save args DTO object, and then for an implementation, I inject the same standard values manager, base class, and then I'm going to pass in the token expander. Um, I didn't pass in the logger class here because I probably thought I didn't need it, but maybe you would because there could be a reason that this could be a place to do it in case somebody, I don't know, at the same time deleted the item and then the thing doesn't exist anymore. But I wasn't thinking that far ahead when I built this. If you go here, I'm iterating over that collection of items that are in the content tree that are selected, which is only one at any given point. I grab the item. Then I make see if it's standard values. If it is, I just ignore this by doing a continue. Or I see if it has any tokens. And if it has no tokens, I also ignore it. Otherwise, I do the expansion on it. And that's just by delegating to the service class to do that. In this point, I actually wired it up a little differently. I created a configurator for it. And that's a class that we're going to have a look at right now. <clears throat> so this is just a C-sharp class that implements this particular interface. This interface is in psycho.kernel, and it lives in that namespace right there. So you, uh, be sure to take notes, write it down, remember it. There, there will be an exam at the end of this presentation. But what this, these configurator classes need to define this configure method. Uh, what this configure method does is it takes in a, a, a service collection object. This is really just, so number one, this comes from the Microsoft Dependency Injection Framework. This is really just a list of service descriptor objects, which is, you can consider it like a POCO that contains three or four properties on it, maybe a few more. One will define what interface I want, what's the concrete class type, or what's the implementation factory, what's the lifetime. but uh, Microsoft decided to create a I service collection to kind of hide away the fact that it's a list, but you can add to the list to extension methods that live in here. And hey, Mike. Then, yeah. Uh, can you increase the size of the font? Yeah. Let me see if I can zoom in. Oop. Maybe I can't. How about I do this? How's that? Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. All right, great. So I'm adding these guys into the collection as singletons. There's the service type, there's the implementation type, and then magically behind the scenes, Cycle will grab all configurators, 
through some reflection on this interface and we'll wire this stuff into the DI framework into the container for us. Um, I'm going to jump back to that config that I showed you. You have to register your configurators in, conf in configuration so that Cycro knows where they are, so it can grab them all. It's going to grab, it's going to go look for them all through um, all of them that live in the services element with the configurator tag and do some magic with that. Um, I also had to still add my pipeline processor definition. Um, whereas before I was registering my services in here, I did that in the configurator that's hidden away in the C sharp class that I define here. And then just as before, you have to set resolve equals true or it won't work. Um, in this case, I'm just asking for this interface, which the DI will go look for that in the container, find the implementation, and serve it up. Then you'll see it's a singleton that only exists once. So that's how you wire that up. Um, any questions so far around this stuff? Have you guys seen any questions coming for this? Um, no questions on on social, but uh, um, I actually have a question yeah. myself. So you mentioned that uh, we can modify Sitecore UI, right? The way it's rendering the content tree. Yeah, this right here. Interesting. Yeah. So what are some some of the things that we can change in there? I am looked at the the this this seems very powerful i haven't played around with it but this seems like there's a lot of flexibility all right so this is yeah this is like different than di but i can talk about it quickly so i don't it looks like i don't have this in my current instance but my last blog post i wrote a while back when i hate to admit that i haven't written a blog post in a while talks about how to actually customize uh, how the content tree is rendered here and what I ended up doing was I built this um, a, bit, a bunch of moving parts to show the kind of items that are in a bucket. And so it used uh, the content search API to go find all the items underneath. And then what I ended up doing was customizing the look and feel and had some text explain next to the bucket item um, with, I don't know, it was like blue font or something like that, maybe italic or something uh, but you can actually run you can customize it, how this is rendered and it's based off of like child items rendered and you can insert html into that and make it just magically do whatever you i actually made put a marquee tag in this one time and it actually kind of screwed things up so you can do things like that but i don't recommend doing that but yeah you can customize how things are rendered here and how they show up and things like that this text this uh checkbox here buckets so in the cycro.buckets.dll, there's actually a data view in there that does that as well. And I kind of use that as a model to build my custom thing in my blog posts. Um, you can definitely go have a look there and see what you think. And it's basically just a class that you can override methods and you can change the way this looks. Very nice. Yeah. All right. So I talked about uh, changing the service provider builder. So a smarter guy than me named uh, Dimitri went and did that and wrote a blog post, and I recommend going to, and having a read of this. So he wanted to use Autofact, and I think he did this as just like an example. Um, I'm not sure if he was like promoting Autofact, but uh, from some of the benchmark stuff I read about Autofact, it's kind of a slow... DI container, you know, when it serves things up, it takes a little bit longer than other ones, but it's a conforming container, so it was probably an easy one to choose so that you could kind of share that with the world. Um, he wrote this code here that just built up his container for him, and some of the stuff lives in Autofax stuff. Um, I'm not a big uh, master of Autofax, but it is a container that you can use leverage if you want to like, have a play with it, but he wrote this code to go and do that, and then it will magically build an ICE service provider for you and return it. Um, but the point of this is just showing you that you can actually go and you can change your container if you're not happy with what Microsoft gives you out of the box. But uh, for most uh, intents and purposes, it might be good enough. Uh, 
I'm actually going to go and I think if I can remember where I put that thing, I'm going to turn that on and show you that, hey, you can do that. So we saw that the default service provider builder was actually in configuration. Uh, if I open this guy up, I'm just patching that service provider builder, changing the type out with that Autofax service provider builder that I just showed. And if this all works, then everything in here should still work the way I showed you. So let's reload Psychor. Just going to click the home node to reload it. Hopefully, I uh, gave enough coffee to the demo gods. Let's see. So if I do this, it should still round. Or not, or an exception. So you can do that. Yeah. And then I'll do, I don't know, what other token do we do? Um, parent name, I think. I forget what it was in there. Yeah, so there we go. You gave me the parent name. Name again. So everything still works. And if we go actually look at this guy. There we go. Here's our custom service provider builder that's building up its own nice service provider. So that's that shows you that's pretty powerful. You can swap this out if you're not happy with what's there. Um, like I said, you can't inject into these kind of classes using configuration factory because I try that and it doesn't work and you get this crazy yellow screen of death talking about locks. So don't, you can try it. I will tell you if you can solve that problem, that would be a worthy blog post, but I couldn't figure it out. So uh, I'm definitely, hey, it's this is your opportunity to shine if you can figure it out. Um, I also mentioned uh, auto magic controller registration code. And this is some code that was written by uh, Cam Figgy. I'm not going to go into the code that actually makes this work, but he wrote a blog post talking all about that stuff. Um, he talks also more about some of the stuff I just showed, goes into details, but I definitely I recommend, recommend looking at that because then you can wire up your MVC controllers uh, or Cycler MVC controllers that live either in the current assembly or you can even target DLLs by wildcards and things like that. Um, you can even pass in, I think, an assembly object if you had to, to just go find all my my MVC controllers that, and wire them up into the container so that I can inject into them. And I believe it also works with the API controllers as well. So definitely probably want to go read this because this will save you a lot of hassle when you try to inject into your MVC controllers and you're like, oh, I'm getting yellow screen of death talking about parameters constructors and it's upset and I, you know, I have this crazy deadline and I got to get it done like before Christmas. Have a read. Definitely uh, a shout out to Cam Figgy for writing that and giving it to the community. Um, Here's some more stuff to go read, some homework for everybody, like over the Christmas holiday break. Uh, go read about Microsoft's Energy Injection Framework. There's some good information there all about the stuff I showed, but more of a, I would say, platform agnostic thing. So it's not really Cycro specific, but Cycro is leveraging this. Um, some MVPs wrote some great blog posts that I've read that helped me along in discovering this stuff. Um, Cam Figgy, as I said, wrote a blog post that I just showed some uh, code snippets from, have a read of his. Uh, shout out to Dimitri Shinchekov for writing his thing on how to swap out the iService provider or service provider builder. Uh, Richard Seale wrote a, some, a blog post about this as well. And I remember he, I don't know if he actually mentioned this in his blog post or not, but there's something on Stack Overflow and how to get uh, simple injector to work in within this framework. Definitely, you know, either Google that or reach out to him on Slack. He's guitar rich. If you don't know that, he'll definitely uh, talk your ear off about it. And then also, actually, Sarah has written some stuff about this well and showed some benchmark figures uh, between the out of the box container versus simple injector. And uh, I don't know if there was another one, but I think that's it. Definitely go have a read of that. Um, definitely, uh, you guys have a lot of time off, hopefully, next week. And if you don't, take time off and go read this stuff. Any questions? Well, this is really cool. Uh, actually, I 
do. <laughs> cool. As always. Um, so you mentioned that you prefer configs over code, um, or code over configs, rather. Yeah. Um, why so? Because I can go, well, I can't put a breakpoint in configs. I put a breakpoint in code. Plus, it's just more of that DI feeling to me. Because, like, if you've ever used DI outside of a, let's say, a sitecore context, no pun intended, um, this pretty much they're doing it through, like, configurators. It's pretty much done like, like this, even though not exactly like this, but similar. There's something that's actually wiring up. Let's say, uh, let me go back to my other configurator if I can find it. So there's something that's a more of a feel of it being done like this. And also, I just, um, I think from a management perspective in terms of like code maintenance and stuff like that, it's just easier when it's in code, especially when, you know, we're in Visual Studio and we need to figure out what's going on and why aren't things being wired up. You can go and like put a breakpoint in here and say, oh, okay. Um, I don't know why this isn't working or whatever. But in config, it's just, you're going to have to go to show config. You have to go look for it. You know what I mean? You have to like, say like, all right, let's think of like an example of like, let's say you have a Helix solution where you have a gazillion things being put, not this particular services. Um, Apparently, I'm not finding, I think it's in a different config. Anyways, let's say you have this huge implementation with a gazillion features. You have foundation level stuff. You have things all over the place. And you have all these things being wired up in configuration. It's going to be really hard to kind of go through a list of stuff that looks like this and just keep scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. And you'll be like, oh, forget it. Right? When if it's in a configurator, you can go find that configurator that might be at your feature level. And they say, okay, I forgot to put it in there. So that's where I, I come from on that. I think the other part is uh, with Visual Studio, you see the references right above uh, line 12. That also helps with troubleshooting and debugging as well. You can see exactly where it's being used. Exactly. Sounds good. Um, another question I have. So there was a time, I think, maybe about five or six years ago when dependency injection became kind of a hot topic with, with Sitecore. Um, everyone was talking about it, you know, all kinds of code was coming out. How much of dependency injection do you guys see in, in Sitecore nowadays? I mean, and, and it feels like, you know, there's always that trade-off of, of uh, uh, cost and, you know, complexity and uh, maintenance. Uh, and the benefit, right, that you get from dependency injection. And with a short life of a lot of websites, you know, uh, sometimes it feels like we bring, you know, a gun to a knife fight. Uh, what are well, your thoughts on that? Well, if you're thinking about it like this, <clears throat> are these short-lived sites because it becomes harder to add new things to them? Or is it more of a, hey, we just want a new fancy website? But let's just rebuild the entire thing because you know, you know, for different reasons. Um, it depends. So you know, maybe some of these things were rebuilt because it was harder to add things to them. Whereas, let's say we had all these service service classes already in there, <clears throat> we can go swap things out, you know, presentation wise, and then we have a fancy looking website. Or you know, we can kind of like, hey, reuse some of the stuff and not have to throw everything away. Do you know what I mean? If we're like, if we approach building Cypress solutions as one-offs, then uh, I don't know. I feel like we're doing a disservice to our customers, in my opinion. I think that I also believe that dependency injection is not adding that much overhead. Um, if you're building on simple solutions, but as you start getting more complex, I think the service um, dependency injection actually adds a benefit as you're customizing and adding new features. And it's been <laughs> Right. Because, I mean, think about solutions where, oh, wow, somebody like copy and pasted this thing all over the place and it's in like a million places and, oh, I there's a bug in one instance and I have to go find them all and fix it. Here, you just fix it in one place and you're done and it just cascades everywhere magically because you had one class doing this. 
you know, you mentioned something that I kind of really like. You know, it's uh, you know, we don't necessarily have to. Let's say if we're dealing with a website redesign, right? We don't necessarily have to rebuild everything, right? We could right. rebuild the presentation only. You know, do some injection. I think that this is where this um, you know type of dependency injection is very powerful. And uh, I think, unfortunately, at least from my experience, you know, whenever uh, you know there's a website redesign, we kind of want to, you know, um, not not us, you know, as developers and architects, but it's usually let's start from scratch kind of thing, right? If it's right. a redesign, we got to rebuild the whole thing. And right. I can see, you know, if I if I were in house, right, this is the approach I would take, you know, and this is, you know, for for clients as well, I would, you know, also build you know, put extra effort to build it the right way, right? But I think there needs to be an understanding across the board that this is, you know, we, we don't need to bring the whole house down if we just want to update the look and feel, right? right? Uh, and, and I think solutions need to use this and they need to build, to be built this way so we can simply inject, you know, the presentation, things like that. So it's, it's. I, I think this way, this is very important to understand that it depends injection and presentation, and um, you know, for people. So the cycle community is aware, developers are aware of this architecture, and you know, next time someone, you know, brings up a question of a redesign, it's not a, you know, let's start from scratch. It's let's inject some new presentation. Right. Exactly. This is very good. Any, uh, any other see. questions out there? Let me check social. None on YouTube. No, yeah, not on YouTube. Let's see. <laughs> not on Twitter either. So oh, well. I'll keep... Well, <laughs> I mean, if, if anybody out there watching this if you have any like questions and you can't ask right now, I mean, you can reach out to me on Twitter at Mike underscore I underscore Reynolds, or you can find me on Slack at Psycho or Junkie, or you can, you know, send me, I don't know, a letter in the mail. Hopefully it's a Christmas card, or you can send me, uh, you can, re you, you can know where to find me because I'm all over the place. So it's very easy to reach out. So, you know, if anybody has questions, just, just give a shout. Slash thanks. that core and, and you'll find Mike. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, thanks a lot for having me again, Silly and uh, Treg. Um, yeah, I'm going to kind of stop sharing, but yeah, thanks for having me. Oh, it's a great presentation. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, thanks a lot. Guys. Thanks. Cheers. So uh, that was great. So the next presentation, and this is kind of interesting. I'm, I'm trying to think of. Now I'm thinking about Psycho 9 and how we can use dependency injection to simplify some things there. But uh, Chirag is going to talk to us about uh, upgrading the Psycho 9. So this is uh, uh, an interesting topic. Psycho 9 uh, is bringing a lot of new things to the plate, right? So a lot of things are changing, even from the get-go, even from the very beginning, right? So it's, you know, there are scripts coming out and you know things are getting easier uh you know in terms of installation um i, I remember in the you know tech preview it felt like you needed a, a degree to, to install Psycho 9 uh, but it's it's definitely you know improving and people are releasing scripts and it's uh, it's being automated uh one thing i haven't done is yet upgrade to Psycho 9 so uh, this is going to be a very, very interesting presentation. Uh, Chirag, uh, go ahead and take it away. Okay, great. Thank you. Share my screen. Okay. You guys able to see it? Yep. Okay. Um, so today I'm going to talk about Sitecore 9. As uh, we see, you mentioned, Sitecore 9 was recently introduced. And a lot of our clients and everyone's asking, which is Sitecore 9, what is the process? Um, how much is it going to cost? There's a lot of factors involved here. Um, so 
right now I'm working on two uh, two different projects where we're kind of looking at analyzing and determining the path to Site 9 for both of the clients. Um, let me uh, briefly introduce myself. My name is Shrag Patel. Uh, I'm a senior solutions architect at RightPoint, and um, I've been doing Sitecore for I think it's seven years now. Um, but I have worked on several large implementations, doing um, a lot of multi-brand large implementations. Um, one of the current projects I'm working on has approximately 900 websites um, on a single instance of Sitecore running. Uh, so there's a lot of challenges when we're looking at upgrading or adding new features or making a lot of changes. Um, so um, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of animations and GIFs and things like that, uh, like Mike, but uh, I'll try my best to be animated as possible. But overall, our content's going to basically go over why do you want to upgrade? There's a lot of planning. So there's pre-planning before you even start planning um, your Sitecore upgrade. Um, it doesn't matter if it's version 9 or any other version you're looking at. There's a lot of things to consider here. Um, as you're getting into the planning exercise, you're going to determine the vision and how you're going to uh, approach your Sitecore upgrade. And then um, once all that's been outlined, uh, then you're going to go ahead and start doing the actual execution upgrading your uh, solution. By the way, if you have any questions, just uh, feel free to uh, stop me at any time and uh, ask away. So why do you want to upgrade to Sitecore 9? Um, this is one of the biggest questions we get asked um, right now. There's a lot of great new things that are coming out of Sitecore. Um, dynamic placeholders is now built right in. If you're integrating with CRM systems or other uh, backend repositories of additional data, XConnect is a huge, huge step forward in how you integrate with the experience profile. With machine learning and Cortex, there's going to be a lot of great things coming down, especially with Sitecore 9.1, where they're going to start introducing a lot of the content uh, intelligence. Of course, you have JSS and headless CMS uh, capabilities. Um, I'm actually uh, working on several different uh, point of views and um, proof of concept. So in the future, I, I'll probably do a presentation on um, JSS and headless. Um, one of the great things um, that's really been, um, I believe, a godsend is the rule-based configuration and patching, especially around deployment automation, continuous delivery, and things like that. This is going to be a huge step forward for managing your solutions and your configurations. Sitecore Forms will eventually replace Web Forms for marketers. But right now, Sitecore Forms is something that's new. It's uh, exciting and it has quite a few features, but is not as advanced as Sitecore uh, Web Forms for marketers. Federated authentication um, is uh, built right in now, so you can um, have your login integrated with Facebook, uh, OAuth, other uh, public um, authentication systems. And then, of course, with every single uh, release of Sitecore, minor or um, major, you're going to have a lot of performance improvements, bug fixes. And of course, with Sitecore 9, they've got rid of the dependency with Silverlight. Thank God. <laughs> yeah. Um, so here's a a slide I share with a lot of our clients and um, setting expectations. So as we're kind of going through an upgrade process, um, there's, uh, I wouldn't call it misinformation, but a lot of uh, a lot of folks really think, oh, Sitecore upgrade is fairly simple and it should be a quick and simple process. There's a lot of steps involved here. You're going to be doing a lot of planning, executing, and then after you're uh, actually done the upgrade, of course, you want to make sure you're doing all your regression testing, smoke testing, um, making sure you get um, every aspect of your upgrade covered, making sure there's no issues before you actually deploy to production. So um, here's a slide that basically demonstrates all the steps that are necessary. And this is um, a very condensed view, a high level view of all the steps that are going to be necessary. So getting into the planning, before you start uh, even thinking about upgrading, let's look at 
all the inputs you're going to need, what version of Sitecore and all that. You're going to collect a lot of technical data about your current implementation um, and customizations, things that you have done. At that point, um, I'll get into how should you think about the approach? What, what are some of the considerations um, when you're thinking about the upgrade? Um, of course, um, when you're doing this internally or even for your clients, the cost is a major factor. So um, they're going to want to know estimating how much is it going to cost, what, what is the impact to business, all that. On the execution phase, um, there's a lot involved here, but essentially you'll need to set up a Sitecore 9 environment or environment where you can do the upgrade. Um, it's really helpful to have a lot of test cases and test plans ready um, so you can actually make sure that once you upgrade, you're able to actually have um, a lot of issues. At that point, you're going to execute the actual um, upgrade, test and validate, test and validate, test and validate. Um, I've been through a couple of different upgrades. Um, we're we're kind of iterating right now before we launch and essentially there's a lot involved here. Um, at that point, um, besides just the upgrade process, you're setting up your environments um, from dev, integration, staging, all the way up to production, performing unit uh, testing with the clients, uh, making sure, especially if it's a, an external client, um, making sure you get the sign off and make sure everything's uh, valid and tested. And then finally, you're going to do uh, the cutover. So as I talked about pre-planning, uh, so these are some of the things that we're, um, I typically do when I'm looking at a Sitecore upgrade, right? Uh, you want to collect your data points. So identify which version of um, Sitecore you're currently on. Um, this is going to help you determine what is the right approach to take to get to Sitecore 9. Um, you want to inventory the sites that you have. Um, a lot of your clients will have multi-site, multi-language, multi-tenant instances, and uh, it really helps to make sure that you're doing an inventory of your sites, as well as um, things to consider when you're doing this inventory is who are your uh, subject matter experts, who are your functional experts on those sites, who are the stakeholders that you might want to connect. So um, some of the challenges I've seen here are essentially different brands or different sites or different um, uh, types of sites like microsites have different um, people in the business that actually um, manage those sites or are the key um, key personnel that you need to work with and communicate. So having an inventory of all the sites that you have in that instance you're upgrading is going to go a huge way. Um, Inventory any customizations um, that you have uh, within Sitecore. Um, any uh, or writing interfaces, or custom UIs you're developing, pipeline changes, anything that you over in, um, through any of the templates you're making changes to. One thing I found here, and I'll show you, um, is using Sitecore's diagnostic tool. So if you haven't used this, this is a great tool that I recommend everyone run on their website. Um, but essentially, this will give you a oh, uh, an output of um, what's deployed in your instance, if there's any warnings, errors, and uh, keep in mind that uh, this is a Sitecore 6.6 version of uh, um, a site that I've uh, inherited that I'm working on the upgrade for, so there's a lot of errors here. But essentially, this will actually go through your Sitecore instance and identify any inconsistencies and in anything that is going to help you with the inventory. So for example, uh, doing a, a test on the assemblies to identify which assemblies don't match the version of Sitecore that you're on. Um, all the Sitecore stores, all the packages that you're deploying um, in, in, the, uh, in its history. So you can see everything that's been installed or deployed um, via the packages in, um, in that instance. I uh, especially look at this to identify, are there any specific patches or um, modules that are installed? Um, not just the content that uh, the customer is deploying for uh, their monthly or whatever releases when they're doing new websites. So for example, the publishing viewer um, 
is a, a module that was available for 6.6 that is installed here. It's also going to tell you a lot of the changes that are not matching with um, on an out-of-box solution. So there's a, a, a huge level of reporting that's provided here, as you can see. Um, running this along with doing um, a win merge uh, comparison against a, uh, a blank instance of Sitecore versus the one that you're um, actually going to be doing the upgrade on really helps. So uh, using min merge, I typically go in and evaluate the root web, uh, web root folder to identify what's um, the same, what's different in each, um, what's the client or instance specific um, folders or files. And um, this is going to help us determine what changes are implemented in that solution. So I typically do this at the root level, especially on uh, the app config. So some of the things that this is gonna help identify are, are there any um, files that are different? Um, this is gonna let you know, for example, in here, connection string uh, file was modified, which is kind of expected, but um, in this instance, our, uh, the team that had implemented this solution initially had done a great job of actually not modifying out of the box config files. They were, uh, for the most part, patching files um, as recommended. But there is one instance where they did modify the Lucene file that's out of the box. Um, you also want to do the same thing with the bin folder, identifying what's um, what's custom versus what's out of the box. Doing a lot of this um, pre-planning and uh, inventory is going to go a long way with helping you understand what is the uh, effort that's going to be needed to do your upgrade. Besides that, um, you want to make sure your solution is well, um, well organized. If not, you will experience some of the uh, challenges as you're kind of going through this. Um, as I mentioned, the config files, uh, make sure um, you're using patches. If, if, for instance, you don't have your um, you're modifying the uh, config files out of the box, this is a good time to actually um, go in and update those to revert them back to what they were and um, implement them via patches. The other great uh, way um, to make sure that your solution is ready for an upgrade is nougify your um, Sitecore references. So as most people might be aware, Sitecore is now um, providing uh, NuGet packages where you can um, reference your Sitecore DLLs um, and Cam Figgy, uh, shout out to RealCam, has implemented a PowerShell script that you can essentially run against your Visual Studio instance solution and it will go in and actually upgrade any uh, locally referenced uh, Sitecore DLLs with those uh, through the NuGet package. And then are you uh, running Sitecore XDB? If you are, then uh, there's additional level of effort that's gonna be needed to migrate to Sitecore 9. Far. Yep, okay. So, that's a lot of the pre-planning that we're kind of doing, um, or you could uh, you know, call it planning. Um, I just have a lot of meetings, and I have meetings for meetings, so I figured pre-planning was a good, uh, good wording here. Now that you're actually uh, getting ready to plan for your upgrade, you need to consider the approach you're going to take, right? So um, for Sitecore 9, if you're on version 6.0 or um, all the way up to uh, 8.0, you're going to have to require. Uh, you're going to have to use the express migration tool. Um, there's two versions, uh, 3.0 and 3.1 that just got released recently. Um, so that's uh, the approach you're going to take to get get to Sitecore 9. If you're on Sitecore 8, um, 81. Sorry, I think I have a typo here. Uh, if you're on Sitecore 81 or later, you can do a direct upgrade. Um, I wish there was an actual express migration tool to upgrade directly to uh, 9 for version 8.1 and beyond. But um, for now, it's just uh, the direct upgrade. You're going to also need to think about the infrastructure. So Sitecore 9 introduces um, 
new infrastructure requirements. Um, for your XDB, your uh, your pretty much there is no support for it right now. So you're going to have to, um, if you want to upgrade right now, you're going to need to move to SQL Server 2016 um, for your uh, analytics data. Um, if you're just doing CMS only mode, then you're, uh, you can uh, stick with uh, 2014. One of the challenges I found here is most of our clients and most of the versions of Cycle that are currently deployed are typically on um, SQL Server 2014. So essentially you, you will need some new hardware, new, um, new servers to kind of do the upgrade. And then uh, same thing with Solar, you're required to have Cycle 6.6.1 um, is what uh, Sitecore mentions it, it's in, in their installation documentation. However, uh, as most people that have tried to install 6.6.1 have found that there's uh, several issues and the recommended approach from the community is to go with 6.6.2. Um, for the infrastructure, um, there's a couple ways that we typically do an um, uh, upgrade. One is the parallel instance where you're keeping the same infrastructure but you're essentially setting up a new IS website um, on the same machine. So you have two instances of Sitecore running on the same machine, one with the older version and one with the newer version. However, with the infrastructure changes and the requirements here, it really does make sense to build out a brand new infrastructure when you're doing the deployment. And then, of course, if you're going to be migrating the XDB data, uh, you're going to also need to have a, a separate process where you're going to be running the data migration tool. Along with that, um, some of the other uh, considerations of planning you want to do is, are you going to stick with reference for markers if you have that installed? Or would or are you going to consider moving to cycle forms? Um, our client is looking to move to cycle forms. So as we're planning for our upgrade, we need to think about rewriting some of that functionality. You're going to need to upgrade all your modules independently. Likely, Sitecore does provide a upgrade for reference for marketers, um, but uh, uh, there isn't a migration from reference for marketers marketers to Sitecore forms. As you're doing the upgrade, it's also a good time to consider some of the re-architecture and refactoring you need to do. So, um, Sitecore uh, DLLs. Uh, have been updated to Sitecore 9, so you're going to find that there's um, deprecated code or breaking changes. Um, if you're coming from an instance that's prior to Sitecore 8.2, of course, um, you're going to have things like changes that breaking changes like cache API, dependency injection, uh, things like that. And also, as you're kind of considering your upgrade, consider the experience editor as well as um, the new configuration process that's uh, implemented in Sitecore 9. And then uh, plan for any code and content freezes and any downtime that you're going to have as part of this. Um, the goal for the upgrade should typically be minimize as uh, the downtime or content freeze. Um, that's going to be a huge win for uh, the business. OK, so setting expectations. Going back to the earlier slide about planning um, and the process that's involved here, um, the upgrade approach is not a simple one. Um, it, it does require a lot of thought process and a lot of different steps, a lot of different stakeholders. Um, so uh, setting expectations internally with the development team, the business team, the QA team, it, it just um, goes a long way. So once I've done all the planning and all the considerations, one of the things that I uh, typically do is create this uh, upgrade vision um, board, essentially that outlines um, what the current system has, what the current um, source application is doing, what tools is it using, um, if it's got Glass Mapper, what version of Glass Mapper, what kind of search provider is it using, what modules um, does it have installed. Uh, along with what version of Sitecore.net, um, any of the infrastructure. This is a um, very simple uh version of the board that I typically create. But it gives you a good, um, a good um, understanding of what might be involved here. And this is um, essentially 
a, uh, a big um, slide that we typically share with our clients to have them understand along with the previous slide, what is involved, what changes are coming, uh, what modules can be uh, repurposed or upgraded to site core nine, what, um, what modules might go away. Um, there's a lot of, especially if you're coming from site core six or seven, there's modules um, that you might be pulling from the site core marketplace uh, that don't support the latest version. Luckily, our uh, site core community um, post a lot of the source code in GitHub for those modules. So, um, for example, the 301 redirect, one of the upgrades I did for Sitecore 8.1, I had to go in and recompile and essentially um, fix some of the bugs, but uh, the source code was available. So we were able to easily do that without just getting rid of the entire module uh, as part of our upgrade process. Uh, keep in mind when you're upgrading, um, it's just not the Sitecore DLLs um, that are changing. It's also your MVC, your .NET framework. So there's going to be some breaking changes, um, not just from the Sitecore code, but also from uh, the .NET code that you're going to need to uh, consider. Um, if you're using something like XConnect or um, Sitecore Publishing Service, you'll, you'll also want to make sure you have .NET Core installed. As I spoke about, this is a simplified slide of the inventory that um, I typically present uh, to our clients, to our stakeholders, um, or even our project managers on what's going to be involved. Um, typically, I'll document um, what sites we're migrating, who the contact people are, and things like that. Before we get started, um, make sure you download all the necessary um, packages. I would read and read, read the entire update um, installation wizard um, documentation that, that's available. There's a lot of um, caveats and things that you need to really um, make sure you understand. And reading through the do documentation, the prerequisites, um, all the steps is um, really helpful. I've, uh, I didn't do that the first uh, couple of times I, I did a uh, Sitecore upgrade. And um, it really introduce a lot of issues as part of our uh, process. So make sure you're rereading, uh, reading and rereading all the documentation that's out there. Okay, so you've done all your planning. You've uh, done pretty much everything you need to um, at this point besides the actual upgrade. Um, when you read through the documentation and you realize all the steps that are involved, it, it's, it really gets, um, uh, very complex. Um, some of these steps are going to be fairly easy and some things you can uh, do within a few hours or within a day. Um, so backing up, backing up your databases and your um, collections, um, updating any um, settings and configurations to remove or disable modules, disable your XDB. Um, as part of your upgrade, if you've deleted any marketing taxonomy or definitions, you're going to need to restore those. Um, luckily, in the previous slide, the configuration files up for upgrade, Sitecore does provide um, everything you're going to need for that. So they're going to provide packages, um, admin um, utilities under the admin pages to do a lot of this for you, including a config file that disables your XDB, so you're not going in and um, patching or creating your own patch file or modifying that out of the box. Sitecore config files yourself. You can just deploy the disable XDB config file, and um, that should do the trick. So a lot of these steps are what's needed just to um, get to a point where you can install the uh, up update uh, upgrade package. Um, there are several ex database ex um, scripts that you're going to need to do to execute um, uh, upgrade, to, upgrade to any of the new schema changes and things that are introduced. There are new da databases that are um, included in Sitecore 9, so you're going to need to deploy those as well. Um, the upgrade wizard is fairly simple. Um, it's, they've made a lot of great improvements um, over the previous versions. Um, so essentially, when you kick off the upgrade uh, wizard, you get to, you'll you'll get to select what um, version of Sitecore you're on. 
at this point, it, Sitecore is essentially um, calling home, identifying what it needs to do for that specific version. Um, this is where the analysis comes in. Sitecore will go in and analyze uh, on the version of Sitecore you have versus Sitecore 9. And it's going to compare config files, DLLs, um, other things to make sure that um, it's helping out with the upgrade process as much as possible. When you do the analysis uh, on your uh, up update package, we'll actually get a result. Um, the result is actually going to go in and tell you what items uh, there's uh, that are conflicting that will be deleted or have been modified out of the box. Any configuration files that need to be modified. Um, one of the new things that is introduced in Sitecore 9 is um, collisions uh, and warnings for your assemblies. It's actually going to go in and identify um, what assemblies might need to be um, removed or updated and where your code needs to be recompiled. Same thing with uh, config files. If you're modifying any config configuration files um, that are out of the box instead of patching, Sitecore is going to go in and identify those and tell you what needs to be changed. Uh, this was introduced in the uh, Sitecore 8.2, but it's been um, improved in Sitecore 9. It allows you to actually um, resolve and make changes directly uh, to your config files as part of the update, uh, update process. Um, one of the things that I found when I was doing the upgrade on um, several of my instances was I was running through the update uh, wizard multiple times. So a lot of times what I was doing is I was going in, modifying the config files, uh, recompiling my code with um, any assemblies and things. So while you're running the update, um, the update wizard, at the same time, you're essentially in your Visual Studio recompiling some of the code and helping uh, with that update process. And it's going to um, basically, your um, upgrade package has been installed properly. Uh, this is a good time to give Sitecore feedback on how that um, update visitor went, any issues you faced. Um, don't worry, your feedback is anonymous and they're not collecting any data about you or your instance. Okay, so a lot of people think I've installed my up, uh, update package, I've done all the previous steps, I'm done. My uh, instance is updated. Uh, not quite yet. There's a lot of things, especially with Sitecore 9, that you're going to have to do that um, once you've actually installed the update um, package. The first and foremost is you're going to have to define your roles and search provider. If you're using Lucene and moving over to Solar, uh, you're going to need to make some updates to your code as well. But essentially, first step is defining your role and uh, the default ones uh, standalone. Um, one of the challenges I faced here is essentially while I'm upgrading, I'm only updating a single instance of Sitecore. So as you have um, instances on production in different environments, dev, QA, production, as well as different roles, content management, content delivery, you may also have publishing and in other um, instances. Uh, you may want to run the update wizard in each one of those. Um, but my, my honest opinion there is that's a lot of work. Um, what, I tend, uh, what I found to be easier is understanding what uh, changes you're making to your config files, identifying what is environment or role specific, and using Sitecore's um, role-based configuration that's introduced in Sitecore 9 to implement those and using the shell config file to identify if, uh, if your changes and, um, are going through as you're expecting. As you're updating, Sitecore is not going to overwrite or uh, implement, uh, implement any of the new patch files that um, it's found. It's actually going to mark those as disabled. So one of the first things you're going to want to do in there is, uh, as well as go in and rename these files by removing the disable extension. Sitecore has deprecated several of the um, search indexes, so you'll want to go in and delete those. You 
also want to go in, um, upgrade any modules that you have, um, platforms for marketers is um, going to be upgraded for you if you select that option as part of your update package um, in the migration tool. But if you're doing a, a direct upgrade, um, if you're on version 8.1 or above, this is a separate uh, process that you're going to have to go through. Um, again, uh, you're going to have to recompile your code. There's opportunities to refactor here as well. Um, and then once all that's done, then you're getting into um, some infrastructure related changes as well. So you're gonna need to install XConnect. You're gonna need to install the publishing service if you're gonna use that, re-enable XDB. And then um, the very last step you're gonna do is actually migrate the XDB content. And this is a time consuming um, process and task if you have large amounts of data uh, stored in a large MongoDB or a collection. Once all that's done and you're ready, um, a lot of things you're going to need to do is make sure you clear your cache. There are some um, issues that I found that just clearing your cache really helps um, essentially turn off, turn off and turn on your computer kind of uh, scenario here. Um, publish your content, um, run through the cleanup databases, uh, rebuild your link uh, indexes, and rebuild your search indexes. So at this point, um, you've done all the upgrades locally. Um, you're going to need to then now look at how you're going to be deploying this. So uh, that's the next step that I'm working on now is um, we've got our solution updated, uh, our Visual Studio solution uh, code, all that's working locally. So we're now in the process of deploying all these changes um, to the different environments. Um, this is where I, I do wish the Express Migration tool uh, was built to support uh, 8.1 and above, um, because uh, things like installing the X Connect or installing any of those um, things like Solar, if you're using um, the installation framework, all that's installed for you, and you can just run um, the migration tool against your source system and have it copy and move any of your changes to uh, site for nine, um, but unfortunately, with um, if you're in 8.1, you will have to go with the direct upgrade and um, install these manually. Okay. Um, observations from not just the upgrade process we're going through now for a uh, couple of our clients, but um, just from uh, past upgrades that I've uh, done. Every minute you spend on the planning will save you hours worth of work. Um, I can't emphasize enough about the amount of time you should spend on planning before you even get to a point where you're just going in. Um, I found diving right into um, the upgrade introduces a lot of headaches and a lot of issues. If you're if you haven't worked on the site or you're not the subject matter expert or the solution architect that's um, developed the site or the, um, all the sites that are on that instance, it really helps to make sure that those uh, people are available to you um, as you're especially have, if you have to refactor or recompile any of the code. Um, ideally, you should have um, the site core solutions architect that actually helped build the site. That's gonna make it um, a very straightforward process. I found having the QA team that actually worked on the project or even having the testing scripts that they use um, when they were building the site or doing the redesign um, really helps. These are the scripts that we will re-execute as part of the upgrade. Um, a lot of times you're not making major changes or you're not rewriting or redesigning the site. The functionality in a lot of cases should work exactly as it did in the previous uh, previous version of Sitecore. So having those scripts to execute, especially things that are transactional, uh, will really help. Um, upgrading any of the external tools. Um, a lot of times I found that within the Sitecore community, everyone is very um, helpful in this case. If they've got a module or something that they've installed um, or that you're using from the marketplace, 
they're very um, friendly and they're essentially very helpful um, and willing to take what it uh, do what it takes to help you uh, get um, get that module upgraded. And then um, last thing that um, I found even in TechCore Nine is make sure you're testing your uh, experience editor. Um, we've had several challenges where we, especially when they upgraded to Secor uh, 8 from 7, uh, as a lot of uh, a lot of folks are uh, familiar with, if you've done this upgrade, page editor switched over to experience editor, and a lot of those APIs um, were renamed. Uh, so a lot of our experience editor code, any customizations like ribbons and things did break. Okay, uh, that's all I had. Any questions? Uh, let me check, check that. Ooh, I just hurt myself. Uh, Do you hear me, Nicole? So let's. Troy, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, there we go. The echo's gone. Uh, nope, I can still hear the echo. Um, strange. There we go. Oh, I had two mics on. Uh, I actually, so this is a great presentation. You actually answered a lot of my questions. Um, let me check social networks, and um, if not, I'm going to be a little selfish, and I'll ask you some of my questions. Uh, let's see. I don't see anything new on YouTube or Twitter. So great. I mean, great presentation. So the, I mean, the First thought that comes to my mind, and I, I think that would probably come in a, you know, to a business user thinking to upgrade the site for nine. How long and how costly is it? Is this, uh, are, we, uh, are we tackling Everest here? Uh, <laughs> I think it depends on your solution. Um, if you're not using a lot of modules and you're not, um, your solution isn't where you customize it, you haven't modified a lot of the pipelines, it's fairly straightforward. Um, this is where uh, I do wish the Express Migration Tool worked on Secor 881. So one of the solutions I'm looking at upgrading, there's not a lot of those customizations. Um, so the challenge I faced was doing the um, direct upgrade. I have to install and do all the stuff for Sitecore 9, like XConnect and things like that, that we actually want to use. So even the things like Solar, the databases, that's where the challenges kind of came in for me for the direct upgrade. If I, if, um, I actually reverted part of that application back down to Sitecore 8 and um, ADO, we ran the Express Migration tool, and it was so much easier. Nice. So how long on average? You know, I understand it really is going to depend on the, uh, the solution and the code and the customization, right? But let's uh, maybe let's, let's take, upgrades. you know, for prior versions. How much more complex is this upgrade compared to the previous ones? Um, with If you're wanting to install XConnect and all that, it is a lot more complex. But I found it with the migration tool anywhere with a, a direct upgrade. It's not that um, it's not that costly as it was for prior versions. Um, right now, I'm estimating approximately four to six weeks to do the upgrade with one or two resources. Okay, um, it's not too bad. And it feels like you know, there's always when when you're facing an upgrade, right? With with customizations taken into account and the content integration and so forth, there's always that question that always needs to be answered in, in every major upgrade. Is it easier to just start fresh? Right? Uh, yeah. Where do you feel that? Is that line now? Is that bar a little higher now? Is it? Is it? Is it, uh, are we going to see, is it going to be a lot more, uh, or uh, uh, are we going to see a lot more upgrades where we're starting from scratch rather than going through an upgrade with version 9? I think so. I think a lot of the solutions that I'm looking at, um, unless they're offshore sure sites, we're looking at actually just doing a redesign because a lot of the sites and instances that I'm working with are essentially old. They haven't been upgraded or they haven't been redesigned in two or three years or even longer. Um, we have 
uh, one of the clients that we're actually doing this um, work with, they haven't upgraded their UI, they haven't upgraded their site in almost six years. So our recommendation there was let's uh, do a redesign and let's start from scratch. Um, because uh, a couple of the key issues that I found were the information architecture wasn't properly designed, things like bucket items and things like that that were introduced in the later versions um, really helped. Okay. okay. Uh, is there anything that, uh, you know, people building or, or maintaining um, sites that are on, on, on pre version nine, um, site core, uh, if they're planning on doing some modifications to to their existing sites, um, you know, for um, version, let's say eight, is there anything that we can adjust um, to keep an eye on to make it easier down the road with them? I think it's same as uh, before, um, but uh, some some of the areas that are going to be major challenges is uh, not on the content management uh, aspects, but more on the experience profiles. If you're making customizations like adding um, new dashboards and new reporting capabilities, a lot of that might need to be re rewritten. Or um, keeping in mind that um, Cycle 9 is speak, uh, now has Speak 3, um, we're looking at some of the customizations on dashboards um, or reporting that we're doing there. We're considering rewriting those with Angular and Speak 3 instead of just kind of migrating or covering those over. Excellent. So this is, this is very interesting. So many new things coming in. We're not in the recent subgrade. Machine learning is very exciting. Yeah, I think when, when we're like doing the upgrade, especially if it's um, you aren't doing a lot with your experience uh, profiles, experience database, it's a fairly straightforward uh, process. Uh, one of the things that I found is um, if you're built in things um, for um, that are customizing a lot of that with introduction of um, X connect, you want to kind of replace some of the connectors that you had for like, let's say Salesforce that we're integrating with your XDB and things like that, where X connect just makes it a lot easier to do. So that's where a lot of the re-architecting is coming in. Okay. How easy is it to like, well, right now we don't have the, the tool that we do, like reform, right? Our, our how, I mean, just looking at, you know, from you know, my experience with the first remark, right? I'm, 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 i the site that we're uh, looking into doing this, it's very simple. We only had a handful of forms. Um, but I have done a, um, a site core upgrade where web forms for markers was a big part of that with several hundred forms. And uh, just upgrading web forms for marketers and all the bugs and everything that came with it um, for that project actually took about four months. Everything else was upgraded except for web forms for marketers. So um, I think it's a blessing that it's going away with um, web forms for marketers, especially. That's one of the areas I probably would recommend. Um, if you're able to, throw it away and start using Cycle Forms. Yes, indeed. Um, I feel like it, it went full circle. Didn't it used to get cold forms? Back before it became web forms for marketers. Now it's back to stack of forms. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, really, really have high hopes. I, I, I watched the, the forms presentation at the symposium. It was very cool. I haven't had a chance to, you know, play around with it and do any of the customizations yet, but it looks yeah. like a good improvement. Like so Dylan Young actually has a really good uh, YouTube video that introduced sector of forms. I definitely recommend um, those of you ha that haven't looked at Cycle Forms yet, take, take a look at that video. Um, it just makes it so much easier. Um, while the name implies that Web Forms 
for marketers was built for marketers. It's not. <laughs> Whereas Psychroforms is definitely built for marketers. Very nice. Very nice. Very nice. Very nice. So, so once you've gone through upgrade, you've gone through, upgrade, upgrade. Uh, you've gone through all the you've steps, 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 you've gone through the kind of the experience. Sounds, sounds like. How solid how is solid the platform is the after the upgrade? Right. So. On, Installing Cypher from scratch, we know it's it's pretty solid, it's stable, right? But how is it, how is it after the upgrade? I think it's, um, again, going through the, a lot of the testing now, I think that's one of the biggest parts of the upgrade. Um, honestly, the upgrading, the recompiling of the code and things like that, that's a smaller aspect of the upgrade process. It's the pre-planning and the testing afterwards that takes a lot of the time. But uh, so far, I haven't seen a lot of issues with that upgrade. That's excellent. Of course, it's also not live and it's not on. Uh, it's brand new infrastructure. So a lot of the challenges that are coming in or will probably come in is more around the infrastructure configuration and things like that more so than the application itself. I think the, uh, the, yeah. um, the root of this will come in once it's live. Right. Yeah, I think from past experience, um, I found that the actual application upgrade is, besides like things like if you're upgrading modules like web from school markers, it's fairly straightforward, not as time consuming as I, I, I used to think. Um, it's more around what you do before, what you do after. And I've always found, unless you're uh, using uh, proper continuous integration deli uh, and delivery and using infrastructure as code or some like proper DevOps processes, there's always some kind of inconsistency in the infrastructure. So an uh, example, not from like the current, but like um, one of the implementations I did uh, last year, we actually found the performance on um, our production site was not uh, going that well because um, while in QA and our load and stress testing environments, we actually had disabled the performance counters, set the logs to be uh, like not debug and not in outputting all the information and things like that, as well as enabling things like the um, IS feature for dynamic compression. None of those changes were made directly in production, but they were all done in the lower environments that we were working with. So we we're like, hey, this is great. And then we get into production and we start seeing all these issues. <laughs> did, uh, did you guys move uh, the analytics data into SQL or did you stay with Manga? No, um, that's what I'm working on now is identifying what it's going to take. We have approximately 60 gigs of uh, MongoDB data that we need to migrate. So right now I'm trying to figure out what that step is going to be involved. And Slickcore's documentation on the XDB migration tool is not as clear as the, the CMS upgrade. <laughs> that's where I was going to go. That's, that's, that's a good point. Um, I'm really curious to see some of the performance benchmarks on the SQL version of Mongo. Like yeah, I think one of the things that um, I'm actually looking forward to is the Cosmos DB, especially if you're going full cloud. I think that's going to be a huge benefit when that support comes in. Um, while you can do full cloud with SQL 2016 and um, SQL Azure uh, with Tecla 9, I think that uh, Cosmos DB is going to add a lot of cost savings and huge performance improvement. Yeah, I was uh, talking to the director of our mail service. Uh, he's, he's holding his fingers crossed for that one as well. It's, it's in kind of the test phase right now. I have a couple of clients looking at it, but it definitely looks very promising. Yeah, definitely. So let me see. So uh, I don't think we have any other questions on uh, social networks or on YouTube. This was an, a great presentation, Trag. This is going to be very helpful and uh, will help a lot of um, a lot of people trying to um, plan out the upgrade and, and get an understanding of what it looks like. Uh, I can tell myself I've learned a lot from just uh, watching it right now. Uh, I'm going to actually, I took some notes. I'll check some things yeah. out and I'll actually probably ping you later 
Um, we have some clients interested in, in doing some things. As well. have some yeah, definitely. If you have any questions, um, just like with Mike, you can reach me on Slack. Um, I'm, I'm on Twitter. I think I don't even know what my handle is. Um, it's a uh, shrug underscore P underscore. Um, I got a, I guess I got a very common name, so I kind of get, actually get what I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> I can relate. <laughs> so, the same, Chuck, thanks for this. This was, this was, this was amazing. Uh, lots of good, lots of information. I, it's just packed with uh, uh, a lot of useful uh, information. Actually, the you know practical information. So, thank you, thank you very much. Definitely, and um, as I go through the process and have more lessons learned, maybe I can present again with uh, a different a little bit more of a uh, authority on exactly what changes and breaking issues we're going to have. Sounds good. I'll, I'll hold you to that one. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, thanks for your time, Shrug. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks to everyone who joined us. Uh, feel free to, again, reach out to us on social channels, comment on the videos. Uh, we're on Slack, Twitter, um, community forums. Uh, uh, we're, you know, we're we're always around and available. So if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to uh, reach out to really any one of us. So again, thanks everyone for joining us and uh, uh, we'll see you in the new year. Uh, happy holidays, everyone. Happy thanks holidays, everyone. Shrug. Bye, happy holidays. Thanks.